In this unit, we're going to examine the synthesis and reactions of amines, which contain nitrogen linked to carbon groups or hydrogen. And amines are hugely important. Obviously, nitrogen shows up in a wide variety of organic compounds in biochemistry and in the laboratory and in products we use in everyday life. Nitrogen is a hugely important element, and it's going to be really the, our element of focus throughout this unit. So we'll see nitrogen acting as a base, acting as a nucleophile, acting as an electron source or electron donor. We'll see nitrogen being oxidized, forming bonds to oxygen. The nitrogen atom is really defined by that lone pair. That lone pair was described as angry by one of my undergraduate organic chemistry professors, and that's a good way to think about it. That is a lone pair that likes to be donated to electrophiles, and we'll see that over and over and over again throughout this unit. So in terms of learning objectives, we're going to start by learning to recognize the general structures of amines and classify them according to their substitution pattern, the number of carbon groups attached to the amine. This is particularly important for alkyl amines, which we'll see can be primary, secondary, or tertiary. Then we'll look at a very important reaction mode for amines, basicity. These are great Bronsted bases and Lewis bases as well. And so we'll dig into the basicity of amines, look at some typical pKa values for related ammonium ions, and we'll learn how to use structural factors, structural stability factors, to rank a series of related amines by basicity. Then we'll dig into reactions that produce or yield amines and apply them in synthesis. In thinking about how to synthesize amines, we may look at a molecule like ammonia, NH3, and recognize the nucleophilicity of that nitrogen as an opportunity to synthesize amines through something like an SN2 reaction with an alkyl halide. We'll see that this generally does not work well, and so if we want to create particularly primary amines, we need to think about some sort of clever synthetic strategies to get around this issue with alkylation of ammonia. We'll look at reductions of nitriles and alkylazids, the Gabriel synthesis, which is a multi-step approach to primary amines, reductive amination, which is a fantastic way to synthesize primary and secondary amines, and tertiary amines for that matter, and we'll look at some rearrangement reactions that can yield amines as well. We'll dig into reaction mechanisms involving amines, both as the reactants and the products, and see how those work in terms of elementary steps. And here, nitrogen as an electron source or electron donor is going to be really important over and over and over again. And then we'll look specifically at the reactions of amines with nitrous acid. And as esoteric as this sounds, these products are interesting and actually useful, particularly when primary amines react with nitrous acid. The result is an intermediate called a diazonium, and these are fantastic electrophiles. We're going to expand our synthetic toolbox for aromatic compounds by looking at aryl diazoniums in particular, ARN2+ which are great electrophiles for nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions. So we're going to learn how to attach a variety of nucleophiles to aromatic rings via the intermediacy of these electrophilic diazonium salts. When the nitrogen is secondary, when the amine used is a secondary amine, the result is an in-nitroso compound. We'll look at these a little bit. They're actually very important, practically speaking, because these are carcinogenic and can show up in foods that contain nitrites and in water streams, for example. But these um, come from the reaction of amines with nitrous acid when the amine is secondary. And then finally, we're going to apply those aryl diazonium salts in synthesis and retrosynthesis, seeing again how we can expand our synthetic toolbox with respect to attaching nucleophiles to aromatic rings. Let's start with the basic question. What is an amine? An amine is a derivative of ammonia, NH3, in which one or more of the hydrogens in ammonia has been replaced with a carbon group, typically alkyl or aryl. And three examples of amines are shown for you on the slide. These are all examples of naturally occurring molecules known as alkaloids. They're called alkaloids for their alkaline or basic nature, really having to do with this nitrogen atom. Alkaloid is a gener generic term for naturally occurring molecules containing a basic nitrogen atom like this. Morphine, cocaine, and nicotine are three examples of this class of compounds, and we can see that key nitrogen atom in all of these structures. And in fact, nicotine also contains a pyridinium nitrogen right here, that uh, pyridine nitrogen, rather, that can be thought of as an amine, sort of an honorary amine, so to speak, because of its basicity. We can classify amines by the number of carbons attached to the nitrogen atom. 
pr primary, secondary, and tertiary are the terms used here. And the reasons we would want to do this have to do with differences in the steric environment around the nitrogen atom. For example, things get more crowded as we add more carbon groups. And basicity is affected by this. As we add carbon groups, take away hydrogens from the amine nitrogen, the basicity of that nitrogen changes. And we'll see what that looks like in the near future. A primary amine has one R group linked to the amino nitrogen, and so we see an NH2 group in primary amines. Secondary amine has two R groups linked to the amine nitrogen, so here we have an NH. And in a tertiary amine, no hydrogens are linked to the amino nitrogen, and we have three R groups linked to the amino nitrogen. And here, an R group is some carbon group, right? Uh, some group uh, in which carbon is linked directly to the amino nitrogen. The reactivity of amines is really defined by the Lewis and Bronsted basicity of the lone pair on nitrogen. Nitrogen wants to donate that lone pair to an electrophile or acid to some extent. And so the lone pair on nitrogen and amines is a very important point of Bronsted or Lewis basic reactivity. To give you a quantitative sense of this, I wanted to mention a typical pKa for an ammonium ion, which is the conjugate acid of a basic amine, typical pKa for an alkyl ammonium is about 10. And this is comparable to the pKa of phenol. This means the basicity of the conjugate base, the amine, is comparable to the basicity of the phenoxide anion, pHO minus. So the neutral nitrogen in an alkyl amine is comparable in basicity to the negatively charged phenoxide anion. And this is about 10 to the fifth times more basic than acetate, 100,000 times more basic than the acetate anion. So amines can be quite basic. And the basic, pun intended, modes of reactivity here have to do with donating the lone pair on nitrogen to an electrophile or a Bronsted acid. So here, for example, in this alkylamine, we've got trimethylamine right here. We can see this red region of high electron density around the nitrogen atom. That is due to the lone pair on nitrogen, and that lone pair can be donated. In pyridine, we see an electron dense region in the vicinity of its nitrogen as well, and that too can be donated. It's an sp2 hybrid orbital here, but that too can be donated to an electrophile or acid. And on the remainder of the slide, we see examples of curved arrows showing this kind of, of reactivity, this kind of electron flow. So, for example, we have a nitrogen being protonated by HCl in this case, donating a pair of electrons to an acidic proton with the departure of Cl minus. And triethyl ammonium has a pKa of about 10.75, showing that this is actually a pretty basic nitrogen atom in the conjugate base. Pyridine can do the same thing. Notice, though, the pKa here is quite a bit lower. Pyridinium is a quite a bit stronger acid than triethyl ammonium. This indicates that the lone pair on nitrogen in pyridine is less basic than the lone pair in an alkylamine. We'll come back to that. Analogous SN2 reactivity is also observed for amines. So here, notice the electron flow is exactly the same. Nitrogen lone pair is being donated, and the now carbon Cl bond is breaking towards chlorine. The difference is we have a CH3 where we had an H in the proton transfer, and the bottom right reaction here shows analogous reactivity for pyridine. So the idea here in all of these cases is that pair of electrons on nitrogen being donated to something that wants to accept electrons, whether it's an electrophile or a Lewis, uh, a Bronsted acid. This slide makes a point that's actually going to simplify our lives quite a bit related to the stereochemistry of amines. If we think carefully about the stereochemistry of amines, we'll quickly realize that it's possible to envision a chiral at nitrogen amine, an amine in which the nitrogen is a stereogenic center, right? In the sense that if we switched the positions of two groups attached to the nitrogen, we would end up with a stereoisomer of that structure. And an example of that is shown here. So check out this nitrogen. We have a lone pair, that's one group. We have a methyl, we have an ethyl, we have a propyl. That's four different groups in a tetrahedral arrangement about this nitrogen atom. It's a stereogenic center by every definition of stereocenter that we've seen so far in organic chemistry. And so if we imagine exchanging, for example, the methyl and ethyl groups, the result is a structure that is the enantiomer of this starting structure. 
We can also generate this enantiomer by flipping the lone pair from an upward pointing position to a downward pointing position and sort of umbrella flipping the amine substituents. That leads to this structure here, and this is the enantiomer of the starting structure. To see that, we can sort of turn the nitrogens towards each other like this, and that leads to this picture here on the right. And if we imagine putting a mirror between these two molecules, it becomes apparent that these are mirror images of each other, but they're not superimposable. And if this is difficult to see, it's worth pausing the video right now and verifying that on your own. These are not superimposable. Each individual molecule is chiral. They're mirror images of each other. Therefore, they are enantiomers. These enantiomers are interconvertible via this umbrella flip process displayed right here. And as it turns out, this umbrella flip process has a pretty low activation barrier. This activation barrier is very easy to surmount at all practical temperatures at which organic reactions are taking place. Even way down at, say, negative 78 degrees Celsius, you might run a reaction over dry ice and acetone. This is still a very easy barrier to surmount. And it, it involves going through a transition state in which the nitrogen is actually trigonal planar. Its lone pair is occupying a p orbital, which I've shown here in blue. And to get to the other enantiomer, well, the groups either fold up or down, depending on which direction we're going over the activation barrier. The two enantiomers have equal energies. That's why they're drawn at the same level on this sort of conformational potential energy diagram. And this activation barrier, again, is quite low. It's only a few kilocalories per mole, and so it's very easy to surmount at all normal temperatures. The upshot, and the nice thing about this, is that even though it is possible for nitrogen atoms to be stereogenic, and in fact it's quite common, if we actually loop back to the alkaloids, we can see this in action, um, that these are actually chiral at nitrogen on some level, or the nitrogens are stereogenic. Even though that is quite often the case with nitrogens, in practice, they're not really stereogenic because the nitrogen inverts so rapidly that we don't see anything except a smeared out amino nitrogen that is an equal mixture of both configurations, quote unquote. On average, the nitrogen looks planar, and so it'll commonly be drawn that way, or it will be implied that the nitrogen is actually trigonal planar. That is a transition state for this conformational interconversion. The good news is we never need to worry about nitrogen being a stereogenic center, really, unless it's in sort of some sort of geometrically constrained situation. Nitrogen is never practically stereogenic.